Chapter 3, Section 1. Why is this disregard for equality important? Simply because a disregard for equality soon ends with liberty for the majority being negated in many important ways. Most so-called anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians deny or at best ignore market power. Rothbard, for example, claims that economic power does not even exist. What people call economic power is, quote, simply the right under freedom to refuse to make an exchange. Ethics of Liberty, page 222. And so the concept is meaningless. However, the fact that there are substantial power centers in society and so are the source of hierarchical power and authoritarian social relations, which are not the state, the central fallacy of so-called anarcho-capitalism is the unstated assumption that the various actors within an economy have relatively equal power. This assumption has been noted by many readers of their works. For example, Peter Marshall notes that so-called anarcho-capitalists like Murray Rothbard assume individuals would have equal bargaining power in a capitalist market-based society. See Demanding the Impossible, page 46. George Walford also makes this clear in his comments on David Friedman's The Machinery of Freedom. Quote, the, ca the private ownership envisages by, uh, envisaged by the anarcho-capitalists would be very different from that which we know. It's hardly going to say far uh, say far to uh, it's hardly going too far to say that while the one is nasty, the other would be nice. In anarcho-capitalism, there would be no national insurance, no social security, no national health service, and not even anything corresponding to the poor laws. There would be no public safety nets at all. It would be a rigorously competitive society, work, beg, or die. But as one reads on, learning that each individual would have to buy personally all goods and services needed, not only for food, clothing, and shelter, but also education, medicine, sanitation, justice, police, all forms of security and insurance, even permission to use the streets for these also would be privately owned, as one reads about all this, a curious feature emerges. Everybody always has enough money to buy all these things. There are no public casual wards or hospitals or hospices, but neither is there anybody dying in the streets. There's no public educational system, but no uneducated children. No public police service, but... Nobody unable to buy the services of an efficient security firm. No public law, but nobody unable to buy the use of private legal system. Neither is there anybody able to buy much more than anybody else. No person or group possesses economic power over others. No explanation is offered. The anarcho-capitalists simply take it for granted that in their favored society, although it possesses no machinery for restraining competition, for this would need to exercise authority over competitors, and it is an anarcho-capitalist society, competition would not be carried to the point where anybody actually suffered from it, while proclaiming their system to be a competitive one, in which private interest rules unchecked. They show it as operating as a cooperative one, in which no person or group profits at the cost of another. See on the capitalist anarchists. This assumption of relative equality comes to the fore in Murray Rothbard's homesteading concept of property, which will be discussed more in Chapter 4, Section 1. Homesteading paints a picture of individuals and families doing into the wilderness, to, going into the wilderness to make a home for themselves, fighting against the elements and so forth. It does not invoke the idea of transnational corporations employing tens of thousands of people or a population without land, resources, uh, and selling their labor to others. Indeed, Rothbard argues the economic power does not exist, at least under capitalism. As we saw in Chapter 2, Section 1, he does make highly illogical exceptions, of course. Similarly, David Friedman's example of a pro-death penalty and anti-death penalty defense firm comes into an agreement. More on this in Chapter 6, Section 3. Assumes that the firms have equal bargaining power and resources. If not, then the bargaining process would be very one-sided, and the smaller company would think twice before taking on the larger one in battle. The likely outcome, if they cannot come to an agreement on this issue, and so compromise. However, 
the right libertarian denial of market power is unsurprising. The necessity, not the redundancy of equality, is required if the inherent problems of contract are not to become too obvious. If some individuals are assumed to have significantly more power than others, and if they are always self-interested, then a contract that creates equal partners is impossible. The pact will establish an association of masters and servants. Needless to say, the strong will present the contract as being to the advantage of both. The strong no longer have to labor and become rich, i.e. even stronger, and the weak receive an income and so do not starve. If freedom is considered as a function of ownership, then it, it is very clear that individuals lacking property outside of their own body, of course, lose effective control over their own person and labor, which was, let's not forget, the basis of their equal natural rights. When one's bargaining power is weak, which is typically the case in the labor market, exchanges tend to magnify inequalities of wealth and power over time rather than working towards equalization. In other words, contract need not replace power if the bargaining position and wealth of the would-be contractors are not equal. For if the bargainers had equal power, it's doubtful they would agree to sell control of their liberty or time to another. This means that power and market are not antithetical terms. While in an abstract sense, all market relations are voluntary in practice, this is not the case within a capitalist market. For example, a large company has a comparative advantage over small ones in communities which will definitively shape the outcome of any contract. For example, a large company or rich person will have access to more funds and so stretch out litigations and strikes until their opponent's resources are exhausted. Or, if a local company is polluting the environment, the local community may put up with the damage caused out of fear that the industry, which it depends upon, would relocate to another area. If members of the community did sue, then the company would be merely exercising its property rights when it threatened to move to another location. In such circumstances, the community would freely consent to its conditions or face massive economic and social disruption. And similarly, the landlord's agents who threatened to discharge agricultural workers and tenants who failed to vote the reactionary ticket in the 1936 Spanish election were just exercising their legitimate property rights when they threatened working people and their families with economic uncertainty and distress. You see more about that in Murray Bookchin's The Spanish Anarchist, page 260. If we take the labor market, it is clear that the buyers and sellers of labor power are rarely on an equal footing. If they were, then capitalism would soon go into crisis. More on that in chapter 10, section 2. In fact, competition, quote, in labor markets is typically skewed in favor of employers. It is a buyer's market. And in a buyer's, it is the sellers who compromise. Julia B. Shore, The Overworked American, page 129. Thus, the ability to refuse an exchange weights most heavily on one class than another and so ensures that free exchange works to ensure domination and so exploitation of one party by the other. Inequality in the market ensures that the decisions of the majority of within it are shaped in accordance with the needs of the powerful, not the needs of the all. It was for this reason that individualist anarchist J.K. Ingalls opposed Henry George's proposal of nationalizing the land. Ingalls was well aware that the rich could outbid the poor for leases on the land, and so the dispossession of the working class would continue. The market, therefore, does not end power or unfreedom. They are still there, but in different forms. And for an exchange to be truly voluntary, both parties must have equal power to accept, reject, or influence its terms. Unfortunately, these conditions are rarely met in the labor market or within the capitalist market in general. Thus, Rothbard's argument that economic power does not exist fails to acknowledge that the rich can outbid the poor for resources. 
and that a corporation generally has greater ability to refuse a contract with an individual union or community than vice versa, and that the impact of such a refusal is such that it will encourage the others to involve to compromise far sooner. In such circumstances, formerly free individuals will have to consent to be unfree in order to survive. As Max Stirner pointed out in 1840, free competition is not free because I lack the things for competition. The ego on its own, page 262. Due to this basic inequality of wealth of things, we find that under the regime of the com a commonality, the laborers always fall in the hands of the uh, uh, possessors, of the capitalists. Therefore, the laborers cannot realize on his labor to the extent of the value that it has for the customer. You go on its own page 115. It's interesting to note that even Stirner recognizes that capitalism results in exploitation. And we may add that value the laborer does not realize goes into the, uh, into the hands of the capitalists who invested in more things and which consolidates and increases their advantage in free competition. To quote Stephen L. Newman, Another disquieting aspect of the libertarians' refusal to acknowledge power in the market is their failure to confront the tension between freedom and autonomy. Wage labor under capitalism is, of course, formerly free labor. No one is forced to work at gunpoint. Economic circumstances, however, often have the effect of force. It compels the relatively poor to accept work under conditions dictated by owners and managers. The individual worker retains freedom, i.e. negative liberty, but loses autonomy, positive liberty. Liberalism at wit's end, page 122 and 123. As an aside, we should probably point out that the full Sterner quote cited above is, in fact, quote, Under the regime of the commonality, the laborers always fall into the hands of the possessors, of those who have at their disposal some bit of the state domains, and everything possessable in state domain belongs to the state and is only a fief of the individual, especially money and land of the capitalists therefore. The laborer cannot realize on his labor to the extent of the value that it has for the customer. It could be argued that we're misrepresenting Sterner by truncating the quote, but I feel that it's that such a claim of this is incorrect. It's clear from his book that Sterner is considering the minimal state, the state as is a commoner state. It protects man according to whether the rights entrusted to him by the state are enjoyed and managed in accordance with the will that is laws of the state. The state looks on indifferently as one grows poor and the others rich, unruffled by this alteration as individuals they are equal before its face. Page 115 and 252 out of the ego in its own. As the so-called anarcho-capitalists consider their system to be one of rights and laws, particularly property rights, we feel that it's fair to generalize Stirner's comments into capitalism as such as opposed to minimum state capitalism. If we replace state by libertarian law code, you see what is meant. So this has been included as an aside before any right libertarians claim that this is a misrepresentation of Stirner's argument. Now, if you consider equality before law, it's obvious that this also has limitations in a materially unequal society. Brian Morris noted that for Ayn Rand, quote, under capitalism, politics, state, and economics, capitalism are separated. This, of course, is pure ideology, for Rand's justification of the state is that it protects private property. That is, it supports and upholds the economic power of capitalists by coercive means. Ecology and Anarchism, page 189. The same can be said of so-called anarcho-capitalism and its protection agencies and general libertarian law code. If within a society a few own all the resources and the majority are dispossessed, then any law code which protects private property automatically empowers the owning class. Workers will always be initiating force if they act against the code, and so equality before law reinforces inequality of power and wealth. This means that a system of property rights protects the liberties of some people in a way which gives them an unacceptable degree of power over others. 
And this cannot be met merely by reaffirming the rights in question. We have to assess the relative importance of various kinds of liberty and other values we hold dear. Therefore, right libertarian, uh, libertarians disagree for a uh, disregard for equality is important because it allows so-called anarcho-capitalism to ignore many important restrictions of freedom in society. In addition, it allows them to brush over the negative effects of their system by painting an unreal picture of capitalist society without vast extremes of wealth and power. Indeed, they often construe capitalist society in terms of an ideal, namely artisan production, that is really pre-capitalist and whose social basis has been eroded by capitalist development. Inequality shapes the decisions we have available and what ones we make. Carol Pateman in The Sexual Contract said, an incentive is always available in conditions of substantial social inequality that ensure that the weak enter into a contract. When social inequality prevails, sec questions arise about what counts as voluntary entry into a contract. Men and women are now juridically uh, <laughs> free and equal citizens, but in une unequal social conditions. The possibility cannot be ruled out that some or many contracts create relationships that bear uncomfortable resemblances to a slave contract. Page 62. This ideological confusion of right libertarianism can also be seen from their position to ta opposition to taxation. On the one hand, they argue that taxation is wrong because it takes money from those who earn it and gives it to the poor. On the other hand, free market capitalism is assumed to be a more equal society. If taxation takes from the rich and gives to the poor, how will so-called anarcho-capitalism be more egalitarian? That equalization mechanism would be gone. Of course, it could be claimed that all great riches are purely the result of state intervention, skewing the free market. But that places all their rags-to-riches stories in a strange position now as well, doesn't it? Thus, we have a problem. Either we have relative equality or we do not. Either we have riches and so market power or we do not. And it's clear from the likes of Rothbard, so-called anarcho-capitalism will not be without its millionaires and billionaires and possibly trillionaires. There is, after all, apparently nothing unlibertarian about organization, hierarchy, wage work, granting of funds by libertarian uh, riches, and a libertarian party. And so we're left with market power and so extensive unfreedom. Thus, for an, for an ideology that denounces egalitarianism as a revolt against nature, it's pretty funny that they paid a picture of so-called anarcho-capitalism as a society of relative equals. In other words, their propaganda is based on something that has never existed, never will, namely an egalitarian capitalist society. 